So we were indeed very lucky when we were able to obtain the very first tape recorder in the world. It was a German tape recorder, and it was the same model that Hitler used. Well, actually, Hitler himself didn't use it, but Hitler's big, big top men used it to record Hitler's speeches so they could be played for uh, his audiences so nobody would know if he were dead or ill or whatever the case may be. They wanted to be able to fool the public. But we had that machine, and we were so excited about it, we decided we've got to move to New York. We were the, I think we were the only ones in the country with that machine. What, what year was this about? You know, what well, was let's see. It must have been about 1949. We were married in 48, and Louis had a cousin who was with Minnesota Mining very high up, and that's how we managed to come by some of these little old gems. Um, but anyway, we shot off to New York, moved to the village, and decided we were going to be part of that life. And God knows, New York and the village had to be the most exciting, wonderful place in the world in the 50s. It was unbelievable. A lot probably like Paris was in the 20s. Um, anyway, we started a recording studio, and we built almost all the equipment ourselves, because um, there wasn't any to buy, really. And we had ideas about how that equipment could be used, and we were, we had the patience, and we, we just, it was our kind of existence. It really did work out well. We had all the artists in the village coming to us for recording work, and it, it was terrific. And at some point, Somebody in California, when we were living there, I did say we, we were first living in California, had said to us, you've got to go to the artist club in the village when you get to New York. So we did. We, we ran there, as a matter of fact. And we were absolutely astonished because there were dancers and painters and singers and architects, and I mean, they were all the creme de la creme of, of the avant-garde. That's what this was all about, was the avant-garde. Who were some of the people that you met at that time? There? Well, of course, it was John. John was always there, John Cage and David Tudor. And I can't remember. There was one architect whose work I especially loved, and his name was something like Kieselberg, and I've never heard of him since, but he was considered the great hope of that period. There was Martha Graham was there. Um, all the modern dancers were there, and of course, their, their composers and their musicians, and people would get up and give demonstrations of their work. And one, one week, Louie and I were daring enough to get up and <laughs> give a demonstration of our music, which was like nil at that point. But we did have theories on sound, and we t talked about them on stage, and afterwards, we were absolutely dumbfounded when John Cage and David Tudor came up to the stage and began talking to us. And it turned out that they had just gotten a grant from a wonderful, marvelous architect by the name of Paul Williams. I don't know if you know his work or not, but he, he was great. And they, it, the grant was for four people, um, two composers and two assistants, and it just fit us to a T. So we decided we would go ahead on this project for a year, 
and it was in our studio all the time because that's where the equipment was. And we would begin, begin each day by somebody preparing a gourmet lunch. It was usually John. He was like the greatest, the greatest cook ever. And he would prepare these lunches that would just knock your nose off. They were so wonderful. And then we would get to work with the sounds and go for hours and hours and hours without stopping. And it turned out the studio became something of a center. Um, John brought a lot of, of really important people and music there. And let's see who came. There was Stockhausen and, and Boulez and um, let's see who they all were. I'm going to consult my notes for this because I don't remember names. Oh, Edgar Varez really hung out there because he was so interested in electronics and he had no equipment of his own. Lou Harrison was around a lot. In fact, he gave a name to our first piece. He called it the Heavenly Menagerie. And that was the first thing we did. Harry Parch was around all the time. It really was a center for avant-garde composers. And I tell you, we just, we had so much freedom. I don't know how you function under so much freedom. I really don't. I mean, Cage gave us the freedom to do whatever we wanted, whenever we wanted. And it was almost too much. It really was because, well, maybe, maybe you'll understand what I mean in a, in a bit. But there were no rules, no history. There was no, no electronic music to relate no to. No history of, of electronic music, certainly. There was plenty of musical history. But somehow, none of that stuff really did apply. We had to do it ourselves. I mean, we started working on on films, avant-garde films, we did a lot of those. We did avant-garde dances, we scored them. Um, we did some plays on Broadway. Do you um, recall who the people in dance and film were yeah, that worked with at the time? We did, we did two pieces, I believe, for Jean Erdman. I don't know if you know her name or not, but her husband was Joseph Campbell, who of course was very well known. And they worked together on a lot of her stuff where she involved the myth. And it was, it was beautiful stuff. And we were able to score some of that. And we scored a lot of films for a guy named um, Lewison, whose family had built the Lewison Stadium. I don't even know who they were, but they had very adequate funds, that's for sure. And he just loved to make films. We did a lot of music for a woman by the name of Maya Darren. Do you know that name at all? Neither of you. You do. Good. Um, she did the most remarkable films for like $200 total budget for each film. I mean, she had no money at all. And she would just invent ways of using her equipment that was so original. Um, it, was, it was amazing. And we would do a score for like 100 bucks for her. It was, was very exciting stuff. <laughs> William's Mix was one of the pieces that you worked on at that time. Which one? William's Mix. When Paul oh Williams yeah. Gave the grant. Yeah, William's was the first. The first thing we did with John. What was your role in that? That was a collaborative composition, really, right? It really was. Yeah, I think what I mostly did was cut little clips of of tape, and splice them together. Um, John had a, a script that was so carefully drawn up. And he, I mean, we would cut those little pieces of tape like they were little diamonds we were cutting. And we really adhered to the screenplay, 
to the T. I mean, it was really something. Turned out, I, to me, it sounded like, like mush, and it sounded like Cage. He had devoted a great deal of his life to trying to lose his identity. He didn't want people to be able to say, there's a Cage piece when they heard it. But he never could achieve that. No matter what he did, it always sounded like Cage. We knew about Henri and Schaeffer, and they wrote us a letter, as a matter of fact, and we wrote them back. And we never had a chance to hear their music, but we had heard about their philosophy and musique concrète and all that sort of thing. We knew. I don't know if there was anything else. I think Stockhausen came along pretty early, didn't he? And I think we heard an early piece of Stockhausen. I guess I'd like to hear a little more about um, the particular kinds of music that you and that you and Louis were making, and how I, I think it's fascinating that it was related to the exact machinery that you devised for it, the, the building a circuit that had its own life. thats I've never heard such a thing before. You haven't, no, huh? No, no, no. Well, see, that's all straight out of cybernetics. That wasn't even, that wasn't our, that was not our interpretation or anything. It just was right there. I mean, he believed that that equations had a life cycle of their own, and when they were gone, they were gone. And, I mean, we saw it before our eyes over and over and over again. It, it was, I wrote down a couple words about cybernetics. It's so amazing to me. I went to the library at UCLA. I wanted to read a little, I haven't read a word about cybernetics for a good 40 years, and it sort of disappeared. I mean, I never have heard about it in recent years. They didn't even have a copy of cybernetics in the UCLA library, which I thought was pretty amazing. So I'm, I'm going a lot by memory. Um, and this is what I, I jotted down. We record, we used many circuits from Norbert Wiener's book, Cybernetics, the Science of Control and Communication in Animals in Machine and Machines. We recorded and amplified the electronic activity and endlessly processed it. Since they were all mathematical equations, they seemed to have a kind of order and organic rightness. Entropy and information theory contributed ideas on probability and randomness, which we had to use since that was the only thing our circuits were capable of. Um, we thought of our circuits as characters in a script and used the unfolding of pitches as they came out of the circuits. We, we didn't control the pitches at all. The emotions which seemed to come out of the circuits, such as romance, monsters, space travel, were almost always in uppermost in importance. Each circuit we built had lifespans of their own, and I just can't stress that enough because that was always amazing to me. And once they died, we never could revive them. We always were innocents with the sense of wonder and awe of the beauty coming from the circuits. I mean, we would just sit back and let them take over. We didn't want to control them at all. Um, we were in a very receptive state, like that of a child working with our eyes and minds open, paying attention to the potential of each circle, a circuit, and we were simply amazed at what great things came out of those circuits. I mean, when you consider like the monster music and Forbidden Planet, that was right out of that circuit.